Hello, everyone, and welcome to the latest installment of AGU Webinars Early Career Researcher Series featuring Chris Erdman, Shelley Stahl, and Yuhan Rao. I'm Sarah Dede, Program Manager for AGU Journals, and I'll be your host for today's webinar on data and software sharing guidance for early career researchers, AGU Journals requirements. A few logistics to cover before we begin. Throughout the session, we will be using some go-to webinar tools to help you interact with us and your fellow audience members. First and foremost, we'll be doing a Q&A at the end of the session. Feel free throughout the presentation to send us your questions. And at the end of the presentation, we'll do our best to get through as many of your questions as possible. You'll find the questions box in your control panel on the right-hand side of your screen. Second, we'll be asking you some questions during the presentation. Sometimes these will be through polls. We may also ask for a show of hands. Lastly, this webinar is being recorded. You will receive a link to the recording a few days in a few days, and it will also be available on YouTube. With all of that out of the way, I'm going to pass the mic over to Chris to introduce himself. Thanks, Sarah, um, and uh, thanks for the invitation. Um, so sorry, everyone, that you can't see me right now. Uh, my my colleague, uh, Shelly Stahl, has actually included a picture so you could see me there. Um, but uh, we're happy to be here, uh, uh, Shelly as well, um, from the, the Data Leadership Group, um, along with Yuhan Ra, who will join us in the, um, the Q&A um, as well. Um, but yeah, uh, we're here to talk to you about data and software sharing guidance for early career researchers and our AGU uh, journal requirements or guidance as we, we like to refer to it. So next slide, Sarah. Yeah, so to start off, I think we, we wanted to emphasize um, that AGU's position statement on data firm, affirms that you know earth and space science data are a world heritage. And, and um, you can see that um, data really are a, a fundamental part of what we do. Um, so sharing it and you know preserving it and and um, making it discoverable have been a part of uh, you know AGU since uh, this position statement came out in uh, the 90s in 90, 1993. Uh, so uh, we've been uh, at this for a, a while now. So uh, next slide. And uh, just recently, we actually updated our um, our guidance, um, and this uh, talk actually follows that um, that guidance as far as it, an outline goes. For the most part, we may not be able to go into all these um, topics here, but uh, we'll cover a good amount of, of this. But we'd like to point you to uh, that, and some of you may have noticed our new guidance uh, um, uh, up here. Um, so we didn't. I don't think we made uh, big announcements, but we streamlined it and, and made it more direct and to the point, I think, with all the things that you need to do as an author. So next slide. So why cite data and software? Um, this question we get um, sometimes. And, uh, um, it, you know, really, it's an important scientific contribution. Um, you're seeing this more and more. And, um, a variety of places, uh, I'm sure, in, in your work of people saying, you, you know, cite your data, it's a contribution as well. Um, you can also get credit, um, you can give credit, um, just in the way you do with, uh, with papers. Um, it's being recognized um, through uh, promotion and tenure, and honors and, and awards uh, system. So it's starting to come through uh, and, and the funders are starting to recognize this as well and include um, some additional uh, funding to help with in, in this case. So next slide. So again, why cite your data and software? It's uh, it's it's easier to evaluate. Um, so we we definitely see this in our um, in the reviews um, of of our journal articles that you know editors are hoping to have uh, you know wanting to see uh, these these uh, these additional research objects like the data and then the software. Um, model information, other things like that, that they're they're looking for uh, to review alongside the you know the the article, and um, the other thing is you can be discovered in in different ways. So um, some of the repositories uh, you know are very well indexed and and uh, you know discoverable, and so you can actually find things through like a Google search that way as opposed to maybe through the journal sometimes. And then um, 
you know, preser preservation. Um, this is this is important as far as preserving it as as a valuable research object as well and linking to it um, instead of necessarily having it uh, um, a, a static thing within the paper. So extracting that out and actually making it more machine readable is valuable as well. Uh, so next slide. And we see, you know, this is not only the, the there's many uh, studies like this that demonstrate the value of citing um, your data and software that um, lead to, um, you know, this, this additional bump in citations. And we included one example here, but there are, there are many online that you can, uh, you know, by through a, a, a search of the literature, you can find other cases where they talk about this, this advantage. So next slide. Um, so yeah, one of the things we come across is uh, um, the question of, do I really cite my data? Do I really cite my software? It's in my availability uh, statement. We'll, we'll cover that uh, later as well. Um, and so, you know, citing it this, in the references is something we have to encourage people to do. Um, yeah, so like your scholarly references, uh, you do this and data used from others, you know, you cite that as well and data you created, uh, data that supports your research findings. Uh, so this is the, you know, the usually processed, aggregated, analyzed data and then software specific to your research. Uh, and, and so, you know, this is something we have to so remind uh, people often to do. Um, so ne next slide. Uh, so how do I receive uh, credit for my data and software? Um, well, uh, you go to a trusted and community accepted repository that supports citation. And so we'll walk through that um, with you um, briefly here. Uh, so next slide. Um, you know, there are many guides out there. Um, I thought this was a particularly good guide from the Open Air. This is a um, European uh, funded project um, to help with discovery of data and, and software. Um, but they, they have a very good guide of sort of walking you through the criteria that you should sort of consider when you're selecting um, a repository. So, you know, one of the cases might be that uh, uh, their policies in terms, uh, you know, do, do they, do some of the things that they're doing is sort of a discipline level align with what you want to do? Um, you know, do do they uh, respond to some of the the uh, um, machine readability, discoverability that we want to, we want to to do? You know, to to help with you getting more citations. Um, but they have a list of other things that you can walk through uh, to really assess um, a repository um, and see if it if it is of a value for you to to use. Um, so I recommend going to that guide. Um, next, uh, and we'll share these slides, by the way. I realize there are a lot of links in here. Uh, and we'll share these slides with all of you so you can click on them uh, later. Um, but we also at the AGU, we, we work with, um, we work with our, our editors, um, you know, our community in general in um, developing sort of the specific guidance um, at, at the journal level. And, and Really, a core part of that is addressing or identifying some of the repositories that you can you can use um, when you're sort of depositing your your data and software. And so we, you know, we we've been going through that just recently of looking at the commonly used uh, repositories that we've seen, uh, along with sort of you know the 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 other organizational or countrywide uh, um, you know repositories that that we see. Um, so that that's a that's a resource as well to to help guide you through the selection of of a repository. So from your community. Um, next uh, slide. Um, we also encourage uh, if you if you know you have an institutional repository, we encourage you to to look there. Um, and you know you may be asking, well, how how do I uh, find it? Well, you know sometimes you can search for it, you know, through a Google search, uh, like all of us, you know, or many of us usually do. Um, but you can, I think one of the other things is there's an invaluable uh, resource on your campus called librarians, um, who are often um, associated with uh, the, the institutional repository that you have um, at your organization. And so this guide actually was done by a group of uh, institutional repositories um talking about like some of the some again some of the uh things to consider uh 
as you select your repository um, for the AGU community. And uh, so it's a, it's a helpful resource uh, there as well. Uh, so next slide. Um, and you know, showing this slide, so generalist repositories, what what are they? Um, the, uh, many of you probably have have seen them. So uh, they go by the name of Zenodo, or they go by the name of Dryad, or they go by the name of Figshare. Um, you know, these are sort of cross uh, discipline repositories. You know, they really uh, um, uh, help across these disciplines uh, and their sort of community resource. And we we see these um, options come up often um, when when it comes to time for um, all, you know, many of you to publish, um, you're often getting to this point of, um, of deciding on, um, deciding, you know, de depositing your data because we have, uh, you know, these, this guidance, this, the, the software guidance and data, data guidance. And so you're, you're looking around and trying to find a repository uh, that can suit your needs. And oftentimes these general repositories are sometimes the only option that, that you have to, to move through the publication process further. Um, so this is a good point to pause and say, it's very important to think about, um, you know, your repository early on. And this sort of has a fundamental um, aspect to your research as well as for thinking ahead and thinking how you might structure your data and software so that, you know, later on down the road, you're not wondering where do I deposit, where do I, you know, where do I put this uh, data and software and describe it um, so that it meets uh, the, the AGU's um, guidance. Uh, so next slide. Um, so I mentioned Zenodo earlier, and I, I, uh, one of the, I think that just the link uh, got cut off, uh, off at the bottom, but the um, Zenodo is an, an interesting repository it's run by CERN and, and uh, um, you know uh, it's it's one that we see used often w one of the one of the great parts about Zenodo is you actually have a sandbox and that's the link that got cut off there at the at the bottom um, so if you type in sandbox.zenodo.org um, it's a test um, place uh, where you can actually um, look at how you might want to describe um, your data and software so other repositories, um, it's you know it's it, it is a great feature if your repository has something like this. Um, it, it's sort of an invaluable resource of sort of looking ahead again and seeing what what uh, what do I need uh, to to describe uh, my data and software, and what what will you know what will be the ultimate um, out, outcome. Um, and so next slide. Um, and and one of the 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 invaluable parts of that is we can also show you in the sandbox that um, one of the, one of the things that we we often have to inform authors about is linking their data and software to their paper once it's been published. Um, so these things are not exactly automatic sometimes, uh, although some repositories like Dryad do this um, and you know discipline specific repositories. But this is a snapshot to show that there's other parts of the process that are necessary to link your paper and your data together or your software. So sometimes authors wonder, why isn't this connected? Why isn't this linked together? Why am I not seeing this in the, in, you know, the sort of scholarly uh, services that I'm using? So this is, a, this is a great example. And I point to author carpentry uh, uh, related identifier section as, a, as an example of how, what, you know, what you should consider when you're uh, doing this. So next slide. Um, so, uh, mentioned this earlier, planning ahead um, and the do and documentations or describing your data and software. Um, one of the things that um, you often probably hear is the um, putting together a data management plan when you have a, a grant. Uh, um, or, you know, then the other one that's less uh, common is probably the, the software management plan. Um, and so we have those links on there, the Software Sustainability Institute has a software management plan um, that you can walk through, but also the other tools that, that we show there. So the data stewardship wizard or DMP online are, are helpful resources to sort of walking through um, how to, to develop a data management plan. 
And so that we, we get that that might be required, or you know, it, it really is almost always required now for funders um, to have a data management plan. Um, but also that can that can have an invaluable um, impact on your research and thinking about how you might organize it. And um, again, that planning ahead aspect, um, you know, that 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 that's the other side of well, I have to do this, but it also can um, pay dividends for how I think about how I can organize myself and structure things so I'm more prepared um, when it comes time to publishing. And this sort of organize, organize your data aspect, we actually got a question on um, Connect, AGU Connect uh, um, earlier about what resources um, you know, are helpful as sort of helping you understand how you can organize yourself. Um, and we point to some of them here. So Dryad, um, good data practices. Um, they have some some really nice uh, it's it's a it's a briefer guidance on um, some of the things to consider like readme how to put together readme files or um, how to structure your uh, folders and name your files um, and then they point to a, a, an even more robust guide from Cornell um, that really goes into even more depth of how how to how to do this and then of course there there are resources from like the Carpentries. Um, uh, where I'm an instructor, actually, uh, that you know you can um, uh, look at um, resources like Tidy Data um, that helps you in sort of understanding how you can structure your data, you know, uh, clean it, and uh, and those are those are helpful resources. Uh, also mentioned the Earth Lab here, um, and Yuhan uh, in that Connect thread also um, suggested uh, the Research Data Management Clearinghouse. Um, as a as a play as a resource in data one, um, so those aren't listed here, but you know you can also check those out as well. So next slide, uh, and, and and Yuhan gets another uh, um, plug here. Um, so Yuhan uh, and other uh, um, others, so Ben and uh, Eleanor um, worked on a, a graduate students roadmap to data management training. And uh, he maybe he can and speak to this later on, but I think one of the the things that I, I liked uh, from this was that they highlighted that that um, aspect of uh, you know you're not alone <laughs> to look to your librarians on campus to help you with some of these questions. Uh, so I, I appreciated that um, because I, I worked in libraries for many years. Um, so, um, but maybe some of the other elements of that um, resource uh, you and can speak to later. But I know. Uh, this was a, a guide that they shared of all the lessons they learned um, that they would have sh they wish they had known earlier. Um, so that's always a helpful resource. Um, so I encourage you to look at that. Uh, next slide. And I always uh, I always like to uh, share stories. Um, and it's always good to look at how uh, others have done this and learn from them and. Uh, and uh, I'm sure some of you might have heard about uh, OpenScapes, um, um, uh, but I think before even OpenScapes, there was this um, uh, work that Julia uh, stewart uh and I think they actually have a, a, a webinar right at this time on this very topic. <laughs> um, but like they had a great paper on the Ocean Health Index um, on how they used, uh, you know, these these approaches um, that I mentioned earlier, like from the carpentries, or you know, these organizational best practices, to really become more efficient at what they do, and realized um, the value, the benefits as, as a lab, as a team, um, and that's what OpenScapes is doing right now, is looking at sort of that team-based approach um, versus the individual sometimes that's um, asked to do things for their lab. Um, this is a really promising uh, thing of thinking about the team, uh, you know, and, and the project. Uh, so everyone, as opposed to maybe the one or you know two people in the lab that know certain things. So yeah, next sli next uh, slide. Um, and and so I think the bottom line here, um, our main goal is that um, we don't, you know, this this visual parachuting someone in. Um, into like finding your data or finding your, you know, finding and using your software. Um, this was something we saw earlier in earlier days where, and, and to some extent sometimes still that we're trying to work on. Um, but, you know, oftentimes we'd see people say, go to the NASA website, go to, 
the NOAA website and my data is there or my software's there or you know the model's there at NCAR. And that's not in, in exactly helpful um, <laughs> because you're at, you know, that person is, is, you know, maybe sometimes they do know where to find it. Um, you know, if they're in your community, they, they, they have a good sense, but not all the time. And, and, and it takes a considerable amount of time to dig in and, um, and find, uh, you know, like what, what was used in the paper. Uh, and, and so, you know, that, that's our ultimate goal is to um, make that, um, much easier, um, and you know, sort of look look at that um, that uh, prize down the road, which is um, you know trying to be more replicable. It's a hard word to say. Um, I get tongue tied, uh, but to be more replicable in your research, um, and, and you know, in, in general, allow others to to replicate as well, and um, and so. You know the the uh, we're trying to create a guide. You know, and and this is what we um, say to people asking these questions: is think about you know the best path and helping that person you know through the path of finding all these um, all, all your sort of research uh, um, objects that can help them sort of replicate uh, your research. Uh, so next slide. Um, so that that kind of information is in uh, an availability statement, um, and so what what goes in an availability statement? Uh, we talked about sort of that that uh, way to to citation uh, that a repository provides, so that DOI a persistent identifier link. Um, you know that not all of them have that the digital object identifier or DOI, um, but like you know they still have some way to guide the user to that, um, you know, particular uh, resource. Um, so we recognize not everyone in the community is there yet. Um, and, you know, that that's, we find ways of making that work. Uh, versioning of software is very important. Uh, the repository name, um, um, some context, right? Of like, what, it, what does this data, what does the software do? What, what is this data? You know, like that before someone even goes there, just some brief amount of context is really helpful. Um, and then, um, you know, we've been surprised by this too, that, uh, you know, people saying, oh, I can also link to my, um, um, my uh, platform that I'm using for uh, collaborating on software. Well, yeah, you know, again, that's all about uh, providing a best path um, to, uh, you know, to, to the people reading your, your, uh, your, your material, you know, your paper. And so, you know, there, there's the, the preservation, per, preservation aspect and the citation aspect, but, you know, then there's the, I need to run this and I need to look at it, you know, like uh, the current um, code. And, and that's the other part we want to facilitate here. And then access conditions. So we still have to wrangle with those, right? As far as like permissions into systems and uh, um, licensing and in-text uh, citation of reference in, in references is also stuff we're looking for. So next slide. Uh, this is an example. So uh, flow flux and feeding in freshwater mussels from water uh, resources research. Uh, so like next slide, um, we can delve a little bit deeper what one of these availability statements looks like. And they're in the open research section um, um, in AGU journals. And so you can see here an example um, of um, maybe not exactly all, all the context that we're looking at, you know, like we're, that brief context of the data, um, what, what's in this data. Um, but you know it does have like the the um, uh, the repository name and the DOI and you know this in-text citation. So um, they're doing a lot of things right here. Um, you know could could have also include some some information about sort of the the licensing side and uh, um, you know maybe some of the other things from that list that we saw earlier. Uh, so next slide. And then here is where you can see actually see that the citation, you know, in the references. So they've included it there. So, um, you know, credit can be given. Um, and this is, a, this is a really great example of, of, of adding it to your references. And so next slide. And then uh, alternatively, we talked about like the, the fact that being in a repository can help with discovery. Um, um, this, this shows you a record that re, that same record in Dryad uh, data repository, and you can see um, 
you know, all, all the sort of uh, descriptive information that's needed in the citation. Um, but what's also uh, great is you can see the metrics down here in the, the bottom right corner where you can see you can track um, these kind of things of how often your, your data is, is being used. So next slide. Uh, so um, what is included in the citation? Um, and, and, you know, I think a lot of these are, are things you probably would say, yeah, you know, know that. Um, but the software name is an interesting one, or even data, you know, the, the, the data name, the data, the title is an interesting one that I don't think we often um, think about too, of like, again, helping with that sort of context to, to help someone understand what does this do, uh, you know, what, what's in this data. Um, and, and so sometimes we see uh, software that has uh, very creative names, uh, but it doesn't, you know, sometimes tell you exactly what, what it, you know, it does. Um, so that's something to consider. Um, and then, you know, again, you see the versioning, the persistent identifiers and, and the releases of software. Um, so yeah, that's, that's uh, some additional information that could be helpful in building your uh, software citation. So next slide. And here are some examples. So this is, these are data citation examples. Um, and uh, you can actually see a versioning example with data. Um, and then uh, an example from uh, Pico Demo um, in there as well. Mentioned Zenodo. Um, and then uh, I, it's getting caught off at the last, uh, the last one, but that you have this sort of data um, citation example at the bottom there as well. Um, trying to remember where where that uh, comes from. Uh, um, I think it's a, a Pangea, but I, I'm not able to see it completely. So yeah, next slide. Uh, and then this is a software, these are software citation examples. Again, you know, versioning information. This, there is an example in the middle of that um, um, sort of creative, <laughs> Uh, Saturn counts is kind of descriptive, you know, but like we that that, that that's kind of in the in the, the vein of uh, these um, things that you know hopefully you can correct in and and describing your software better. So one way to do this sometimes you know uh, people find this out once they do the release of their software through. In this case, they used a mechanism through um, GitHub and Zenodo where you can release and get a um, your software preserved and cited in Zenodo. But they, they didn't, uh, you can actually uh, create a new version to change the, the name um, and, and make it more descriptive here. Um, but maybe, maybe that ultimately is not, is, is not required, but um, could be helpful. And then, um, you know, other, other information here again about version and, and date and um, the name of the repository. So these are other examples that we found uh, of software citations. That might help you. So next slide. Um, this will save your life. <laughs> uh, yes, a DOI citation formatter can save your life. Uh, so this this actually is a tool that um, you can plug in um, DOIs. Um, oh, and the URL is cut off again here, but it's uh, c uh, citation.crosssite.org. And I think maybe uh, um, Shelly or, or uh, Johan might might include that in the chat, um, but you can you can include a DOI in in this uh, um, tool, and it can actually um, format your citation so that you can um, easily sort of plug it in. Uh, so uh, next, um, an, another thing we we often forget about is licensing your data. Um, and you know that this becomes really critical later on in sort of understanding if I can reuse, you know, what, what are the sort of the conditions, the permissions in reusing your data. And we sometimes publish these things and not and not uh, and not think about them. And luckily, uh, repositories are actually um, uh, know this. Um, they've seen this in their systems, and they actually guide um, guide researchers to sort of the you know, usual common suspects uh, that we see. So. Creative Commons CC0 or CC BY, um, uh, which is CC is Creative Commons, uh, and, and you know that that's the fourth uh, version of, of it. Uh, um, but BY is um, really CC 
has no real conditions. Uh, you know, it's the most, most permissive one um, license that uh, you can find. Um, and why would you want to do that? You know, just completely open something up. Is it, it really just um, creates very little barriers. If you want people to reuse your data, then, you know, lessen the barriers. Uh, and uh, you, you see this data cannot be copyrighted under um, U.S. law. Another interesting thing that's not um, noted here is that actually, I think in, in Europe, um, they actually default to uh, CC BY, uh, Creative Commons BY, um, which requires the attribution uh, aspect. So like giving credit to the authors, uh, um, you know, to, to the actual authors uh, is, is a, um, a condition. So whenever it's CC zero, I think in EU, they, uh, they default to maybe the repository name or, or uh, you know, so it's something to to uh, to note as well um, when you're when you're thinking about this. Uh, so next uh, next slide. And and you know, here are some resources, additional resources. Again, <laughs> I think we might have shared these slides with you already, um, but we will. <laughs> and understand there's a lot of information in these. Um, but you know, Data Carpentries had a really nice post about um, you know. Uh, discusses just the, the the process of releasing your data um, in a public repository, um, and it's really helpful to walk through the process in that blog post. Um, and Creative Commons has a wizard that um, helps you walk through sort of these decisions as well. Uh, data Cur Curation Center as well. Um, they have some of these complex uh, questions that you might uh, run into, and then. Of course, then we have the intellectual property um, resource by uh, Cornell, Cornell U University if you really have complex uh, um, intellectual property rights um, questions. So um, I hope you visit those resources later. Next slide. And then for choosing a, li a, a software license, uh, there's this choose an open source license uh, wizard. Um, and Actually, on this uh, uh, wizard, uh, there are uh, some resources on showing you what are the commonly used um, um, software uh, licenses out there. I think that's kind of invaluable to see like what are other people using um, to make to help with making your decision. Um, so uh, I encourage you to go to that resource as well. Next slide. Um, this is a particularly tricky question that we've been receiving on models and simulations. So, um, you know, can you preserve all the data in a repository? Um, once it, get pa it gets past one terabyte, very tricky to do this. You know, not, not every repository has this kind of functionality. And is it really uh, necessary um, is another question. You know, it, it, are there sort of other things that you can you can use that that are valuable? Um, and this resource from the RCN, this uh, uh, group from NCAR actually um, is they're thinking about um, these questions or like what what should be um, preserved. But we've also been thinking about them with our editors and other community members in um, AGU in our um, in our journal specific uh, data and sharing guidance. And, and we're hoping to, to publish that uh, sort of shared guidance between, between at least four journals at the moment that have really thought deeply about this, like what, what particular things should be, um, should be um, preserved and what, you know, what are the things are, you, you know, you could share, but they don't need to be preserved, but they are, you know, they are helpful. Um, and, uh, and those are, I think those are questions we're receiving more and more because, uh, you know that the data is just there's there's bigger and bigger data um so um so i encourage you to look at that resource as well so next slide um so uh, share learn from work with our community um in the i i think you know it's very common to uh put out these policies or put out these um guidance docs and you know there's a lot of work uh, underlying everything where you there's a there's community members involved and um, but you know there isn't the transparency and the sort of collaborative aspect with the community in developing this guidance and I think that's very much in a direction that we want to head in which is we want to be more transparent we want to work with our community to improve um, you know the, this guidance because we, we can't necessarily track everything and uh, 
you know, we're better as a community together. Um, so next slide. Um, so we we launched just recently again. Maybe there wasn't a grand announcement about this, uh, and we're we're working through this as a resource. But um, data.agu.org is where um, we want to work uh, with our community. Um, oh, th that's good. Go back to the next slide, <laughs> and that that's perfect. No, no, the next slide after that. <laughs> Yes. Okay. So it, as you can see, it's a GitHub hosted site. Um, and um, what we want to do is actually make it easier for you to submit issues or pull request changes to help us improve um, the guidance. And, you know, as we progress on this sort of more transparent collaborative process, I, I think, you know, we, we'd hope that more and more community members really get involved in some of the material that we're developing. Um, and even, you know, develop some ownership of her or like some maintainer, um, you know, uh, uh, status, you know, to help us, um, you know, to develop this further. And so the next slide, one of these uh, resources, uh, you know, is, is one that we just uh, put up on uh, GitHub. And uh, we started off, we actually started off developing this resource um, in Google Docs, again, with like certain groups of people, uh, like the Pangeo community or NASA or, um, you know, other societies. And uh, there were a lot of people sort of looking at this, this Jupyter Notebooks guidance in the Google Doc, and there were multiple versions, every, you know, all over the place. Um, and then we released it to Zenodo as, as a PDF. And so very much in sort of like this um, traditional way of publishing and uh, we very much want to move to that sort of GitHub way of doing things where uh, we can, you know, track all this work and version it and allow others to sort of join the conversation and contribute. Um, so this guide is actually up on, on that data.agu.org uh, um, um, and, you know, you can actually contribute it through the GitHub um, um, platform and, and submit an issue or, uh, uh, a pull request. Uh, so we welcome that. Next slide. Um, and then the last thing to mention here is we actually have an email uh, called datahelp at agu.org that goes to my colleague and uh, I, Shelly Stahl, um, where we get really tricky questions or we get really great questions about moving um, organizations forward and thinking about how they can be more open with their data. So that was one of the questions we actually received today and it's really uplifting um so yeah this this is another resource you know i'm getting it's getting close to publishing time um am i doing this right you know those are the kind of questions we get or i need help deciding on a repository uh, that's a very common one um you know permissions challenges we work on those as well uh, so this is a resource please uh, feel uh, free to tap into it. And that I think completes, if you go to the next slide. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you from Shelly and I, and Shelly will actually take over the Q&A here and, uh, and along with you, Johan, and I might um, chime in too, but uh, thank you all. Hi, all. I've launched a quick poll as we transition over to Shelly, who will talk about some of the questions we've received so far. If you guys are following the chat, I think you all should be very comfortable with this answer, so, um, or the, the Q&A. Hopefully we get a really fantastic Thank, that was a lot of content. Um, the uh, link to the slides uh, was uh, somewhat, oh, good, good, that's good. I, green is good, green is good, confident, that's good. Okay, the 5% are not confident, you have our email address. You know when to ask questions, we're happy to help. Um, so uh, we had a whole bunch of Q&A, um, many of them around, uh, both data and software. Uh, lots of content that came. Uh, so I, I was, uh, Sarah was our um, our Sherpa when it came to providing you with links to everything. Um, so hopefully you've got all of this, the link to the slides. Um, uh, Sarah, if you don't mind, can you, if you could put that uh, back into um, 
back out to all the participants in case anybody missed it. That way you'll have the information that Chris provided. And Sarah, I can't see any open questions because of, I guess, the, the, the way things are displayed to me, but I, I can try to go back and maybe review some of the questions that came through before. Yeah, if you could review the questions that came through before, I know from my end as a journal manager that GitHub questions come up a lot, so that might okay. be a good one. All right, all right. So, so Robert asked about GitHub, and this is just a fantastic question. We love GitHub as a development platform, um, and uh, it's really great collaborative work. But what you need to know is, as a preservation repository, uh, it it's not it's not preservation. And what we mean by that is, um, the terms of use for GitHub. Uh, allow the um, the owner of the repo. We, it's called a repo, but don't think of it as an actual repository. It's 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 kind of an overused word in this case. It's not preservation. Um, the owner of the repo can delete the contents at any time, and uh, uh, GitHub reserves the right to delete as well. That it's not a practice that they have, but terms of use allow them to delete. And uh, a preservation repository, one that assigns a, D, uh, a digital object identifier, uh, is committed to persistence, such that um, only under uh, an ethical violation of some kind or some other extenuating circumstance that's rather serious, uh, you, you you don't the scientific record is not deleted. Um, so uh, that's why GitHub has partnered with Zenodo. There's a really fantastic, though imperfect bridge to Zenodo where you can uh, preserve your um, the version that you uh, of software or whatever you had in your GitHub um, in uh, Zenodo DOI. Uh, you can version control that. You can continue doing updates. And we do have some examples where you can see years of updates and new DOIs assigned, but they're all connected through versions. It's, it's really lovely. Um, something to note there, the imperfect part. Um, Keep in mind, we all have monikers in GitHub. You're not actually using our full names as necessarily. I, I do, but I'm perhaps an anomaly. Um, but when you when the names of the creators come across or the developers come across to Zenodo, they come across as the monikers. So, um, and that may not recognize, for instance, somebody who helped design the software or test it, or maybe wrote the documentation. And they should get some. Uh, they should be acknowledged for contributions as part of the author list or creator list. Um, so please go ahead and make that correction on Zenodo side once it comes across. Uh, the other thing to correct is the file name. Um, sometimes the file name is my software. Funny, right? But that's not so great when you put it in the scientific record. Uh, we're, uh, we would like you to thoughtfully consider what your file name should be so that it's meaningful. Um, even to you, five years down the line. Um, so great, um, Robert. Hope I hopefully I typed pretty much all of that in the answer or attempted to do so. Um, there was a question um, from uh, Ravindra about licensing, uh, specifically about MATLAB. I I I on purpose skirted MATLAB because I haven't done the research myself. Um, and if uh, Yuhan or Chris, um, know more about the MATLAB specific licensing, please hop in here. Um, but I did provide a link, um, although I'm not really seeing that in the answer. Um, Sarah, can you confirm there's an actual answer to that question? Because I, I know I typed one, but maybe I messed it up. Um, there's a, a, a lovely place where you can go after open software um, licensing. Software is different than data. You, you want to think about that. The, the usage requirements are different. Um, and you want to use um, software licensing for software. And, and usually it's Creative Commons for data is the common practice. There are other choices. Um, I don't know if... Uh... I, I, it's funny, I don't see these questions, <laughs> but um, I don't, you on um, what I also, I also don't see the question. So do you mind like repeat the question, Shannon? Yeah. So, sure, yeah, I I, I might, I, I'm, I'm per, yeah, I will, of course. Uh, uh, would you please let us, uh, let us know if I need to state any specific type of license or which kind 
for my MATLAB programs when when I use them, when I define them within the paper. So, so Chris, the guidance you gave on the availability statement of define what the license is, which is the best practice. Um, now, it's for specifically for MATLAB code, what would that look like? Um, I did a quick search on MATLAB and came up with MATLAB licensing. So I, I'm going to have to spend a little time actually getting down to sharing and publishing MATLAB code to find where they guide on what options they provide for licensing, or if it's um, and there's also options to use for other repos. I uh, I don't know if Johan wants to, but I have seen this case um, come up before, and yeah, we have uh, guided them to the guidance that MATLAB has, uh, but I, I wanted to actually ask, uh, well, in, in general, I know that the Python community has done, um, has, you know, has done a lot to try to, you know, create sort of these pipes, uh, you know, to, to use the same functionality that you can find in MATLAB in, you know, sort of these open, open source uh, programming tools like, uh, you know, like Python, um, but the other thing is I, I and I'd have to ask Johan about this because it came up at our EarthCube meeting. But I believe that MATLAB um, has a way to sort of look, you know, review things sort of in an open way too. Um, but um, and I don't think that's actually the question they were answering. They they were asking about licensing, but I'm just curious, Johan. I think that that's also they have MATLAB has a sort of open way of reviewing things too, right? Yeah, uh, MATLAB basically created their like own market of sharing the sharing a notebook, the Mar uh, MATLAB uh, live scripts, and also their um, their uh, their code, basically the their code exchange. So I'm assuming that they are okay with you share all the MATLAB codes under your own discretion, because you're not touching their base code of the uh, MATLAB on like uh, programs. So I think they would be okay with that, but I agree with Chris that it might be worthwhile chat, uh, check the MATLAB policy on that. But I, yep. yeah, that's all I can say for now. Maybe that's a good blog post, Chris. We should put one out. <laughs> yes. Yep. Um, Doug Schuster asked a really great question and I'm, I'm glad he did. Um, if, if I've got a data set and I have a lovely citation to go with it, but then I also have a journal article, like a data paper that describes the data set, how it was created, its value. Should I cite both? Um, so answer, oh yes, please. Um, you've got a brilliant description of that data set, which is, makes it much more easy to understand. And of course the data set itself is its own separate research product. Um, for AGU journals, we do not uh, have fees assessed against the reference section. So you should include everything necessary in your reference section. Um, and that, yes, please do cite both. Then credit, for instance, um, if the folks that created that data set were different creators than the ones that actually authored the paper, then they both get credit um, for the reuse utilization of that obviously valuable data set. So, great, great. Um, Shelly, I see there's a new question comes in and I would just be the one who read the question for you. So oh, how public? how public the researchers need to make their data and code when submitting their publication. Basically, how can we show that we are meeting the requirement for making them available without making things public prior to publication? I think that's a great question. So many, many repositories actually allow a, uh, uh, well, I'll use the word embargo, although that's heavily overused word. Um, uh, embargo meaning it's in the repository, it's either going through curation uh, process or perhaps it's already complete um, and the, they're waiting for the paper to be accepted so that the connection can be made um, with the, the citation for the, uh, the data to the paper itself um, and vice versa. Um, so mo many, I will say most because I think that I don't think I can say most, but many will already do that. Um, uh, th there are other options as well um, uh, where you could, um, this isn't preferred, but because the, the space that we're in is, is not always clear, uh, I will share it. Um, we do allow you to put uh, the data for peer review purposes into the supplement because that's a confidential location. 
Um, but it can't be archived there. It can be placed there if it's small enough. If it's too big, it, then we we run into the problem that Chris mentioned earlier about challenges with large data, no matter what you're trying to do with it. Um, uh, but you can temporarily place it into the supplement location where the peer reviewers can take a look. But you need to indicate in your availability statement, my data is in this repository, it's being curated, it will be ready by the time of acceptance, or there'll be a, a timing, uh, we'll have to watch timing there. Um, something we're familiar with, we realize that's a challenge, but we, we understand. Um, and then uh, then peer review will have access and the process of your paper being reviewed um, can proceed. And then by the time um, you get to revisions and acceptance, uh, what we're expecting is that there will be, the repository will be finished with curation. Um, there'll be a moment in time where that can be made open, the citation can be placed in the paper, and then everything comes together and goes off to, be, to the wonderful world of publication. I do also just want to add a comment on that question. I think you also want to consider why you don't want your data set to be published even before the journal or the submission is like being accepted because um, if it's because of the privacy or like other reasons that uh, or there's some reason logistic consideration then you can do that but I would argue that it doesn't hurt to just make the data set public even before a publication is uh, officially accepted because that also creates um, connection with others who might be interested in your work. Just my personal opinion, but I would encourage make it like open as early as possible if you feel comfortable. I love that. I love that. That is, that is what I would like as well, but we have so many researchers that are, um, for whatever reason, being told, you know, don't be scooped, um, you know, keep that data tight, don't, don't share. Um, but what you just said, Johan, is that you actually might gain opportunity for more collaboration, for more input. Can you can you talk more about that? So yeah, and I think um, B scoop that's something that people are really worried about. But I also there are a lot of, like a network or like connection happened right after you made your uh, presentation at AGU. Most of those work are not published because you share the results in. People will like ask you for the data or ask you for the things, and with the um, the art uh, the archive or the the Earth archive that, that those like things you can already submit your manuscript. So basically, as a marker that you already did that work, but it's like under review together with your data set together. So I think um, it's less risky now a days to publish the data set even before your um, uh, manuscripts are officially accepted, I think. Yep, yep. So Earth Archive is um, one of the uh, preprint archives that is out there, and we also have the ESOR archive um, that uh, uh, AGU, along with other societies, supports. Both are fantastic archives, so we, we love them dearly both. Um, they have just have different um, uh, uh, features. Uh, Maria has a has a really great question. She's talking about dynamic data set. If I have a data set that's being updated monthly or yearly, how would I go about storing it in a repository and citing it? That that's a, a no kidding challenge. Um, so you're describing a dynamic data set. Um, this is something where you continue to get observations. Um, I I can think of a couple options. Um, I, you don't indicate how large it is. So let's just say it's not too large. That it's something that most repositories wouldn't mind holding. You can version control that. You can decide when you'll do your updates. Maybe they're quarterly, maybe maybe monthly. Um, uh, if someone's using your data set, then you actually are providing a service so that you're you know, providing um, those updates on a timely basis and they know when to expect them. Um, there are a number of repositories that can handle version control no problem. Um, so as you add records, you would version that data set and it would continue um, to go forward. Uh, have you looked for perhaps a domain repository within the space you're working where you could they, you, they could actually house that data for you and manage the dynamic uh, nature? Um, and then citing it is, is um, can be challenging. There, there are some repositories, um, and maybe I'll stop because I'm sure Yuhan has, has more examples that are, that are even more relevant, um, where there's a DOI for the 
data set itself, but then there uh, is a the technique of using a um, uh, a query and the query you also put a DOI on the query so that someone could repeat the search later. And there's guidance um, in both ESIPs uh, data citation guidance as well as RDA's dynamic data citation that can can walk you through how to do that. I've seen an example in uh, in uh, high energy physics where they actually uh, um, it's a good one where they have actually scripted this. Uh, so you know with with the, the the work that's being done at CERN is that the data is sort of dynamic dynamically deposited basically in, a, in an automated automated fashion through the scripting. And so the example they had was uh, through Zenodo, but you can do that with some other services, you know, like uh, um, even you know the domain solutions as well. Um, so the scripting part is one, and then there are some groups that use um, uh, the Git Git large file storage LFS uh, is another way to sort of version your data. Um, but ultimately, you sort of have to preserve it, right? And um, do do that aspect. Um, but yeah, the versioning happens sort of in an automated fashion through the the, the scripting, so they don't have to worry about. It. <laughs> comes off the instrumentation, it gets deposited, you can cite it based on sort of the, you know, the timing of it all and, uh, you know, they, they sort of structure it that, that way. But that, that's an example I've seen, uh, Johan, if you... Yeah, and another example, if the data is like too dynamic, for example, it's like hourly or by the minutes, then you may want to consider like develop a software instead of data set itself. So basically it's providing a software that can do the data um, data grabbing or data processing. And so instead of directly sharing the data, but like sharing the software that can process that really dynamic data would be another option you can go. And like Chris had mentioned, you can ask people to cite software as well, not just the data. Yeah. So Maria, we don't, we don't know how much data you're gathering, but it if you're talking about monthly or yearly, then maybe you can keep it simple and just use the version control on a on a on a repository. Um, Daniel is actually giving us information about MATLAB, which I really appreciate. So there's also Octave and Scilab as open source implementations of much of MATLAB, and you might be able to argue. Uh, we'll have to check on the word argue here uh, that Octave code needs to be um, GPL, uh, so the license GPL. Um, uh, my general feeling is that source code can uh, have most licenses, uh, barring GPL or similar terms, but standalone executables have more restrictions on distribution. Yes, MATLAB executables probably require purchasing a special license. Octave ex executables may need to be GPL. So Daniel, maybe you need to partner with us on a blog post on this, or maybe there's one out there already that we can just highlight, um, bring to everybody's attention. So thank you for that. Uh, maybe to add here, Shelley, too, like mentioning that um, journal specific guidance that we're working on. I know that there's sort of a push within that guidance to, you know, to also sort of stress the fact that open is is a good option here, <laughs> open source, and and you really just having access to the code is is really invaluable. Um, so that I've seen that in sort of our upcoming guidance as well that we're sort of trying to push more in that in that space. So. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, some research is so dependent on the software itself um, for the results that it's part of what needs to be evaluated. Um, and we're he we're hearing our own editors be more emphatic about access to the software and to be able to actually evaluate um, uh, the, the the our papers coming in. So, yeah, which is great, which is great. I think Sarah wanted to run a poll. I think did we get through all the comments and questions? She wanted to run a poll. <laughs> oh, here it comes. This is a good one. Get your answers in. I can't wait to see what the answer is.
Yeah, same here. <laughs> yeah, it's it'll tell us which which blog post we put out next, right? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you know what? That makes sense. So folks start thinking about their data when they finally get their paper finished. You know, I I, I resemble that remark. Um, uh, I, I even as the grant one of the grants that I have uh, with a six country team. Um, even though I had a that we have a data team associated with the researchers, so experts that represent the repositories we've selected. Even then the researchers writing papers still did not curate the data until it was after the paper was submitted and it was like one of those i can't even make people in my own backyard do something earlier so that's just how it is and we need to evolve our habits from there i want to just do a plugin for our roadmap that it specifically describe that when you start like doing your data collection, I think that's when your like curation should start because throughout your research process, that would be a, you, it's always a good idea to start curation as early as possible because the curation also helps you to make your research more organized because you don't want your, your data to have something named rival one or rival two, you want to make it as clear as possible with the metadata that's necessary for you to understand the data like five years down the road, because some research can last from like five to 10 years or, yeah. Yeah, that's a really good point. And, and, and you'll have evolution of researchers. I mean, even PIs can change. So how do you establish the practices right at the, at the beginning that will, um, that will instill across all of the members of the team um, throughout the life cycle of the project? Um, this, this project that we're on, um, uh, actually, one of the one of our outputs is taking a look at making a. You, you've probably all heard about data management plans, but taking a look at that as an operational tool, a workbook, something that's a checklist that you can um, help your researchers make new habits on tracking um, the created data, the data that they're using, um, uh, documenting the the clean, uh, scripting the cleaning. The cleaning um, steps that you're taking, um, you know, don't do those by hand. Script it so that you can actually reproduce what you're doing. Imagine you're a year into your research and you realize there was a fundamental um, challenge that you're running into, and you had to back up to the very beginning in order to um, uh, to make an adjustment. Did you keep the the raw data from the very beginning such that you can actually start from from scratch and walk the steps through? Um, please do. Please make sure you all the raw data is always saved somewhere, um, so that you can you can actually reproduce everything. If you if you take like cleaned data number three, then you, and you didn't track how you got to clean data number three, you already ran into a problem. So, have been there several times. <laughs> and it's it's just habit. It's just habit. Taking, taking the time to figure and another one that's it's even more complicated is vocabularies so think about it in a simple way think about it as the uh the file name uh, or the, the the column header name like what what's the column header name that you give that data and is it aligned to your community expectations do you know what vocabularies your community uses um it, this is a challenging problem right now it that can be a hard answer for folks, and it would be fantastic if our community was asking that. Listen, you know, we were on the AGU webinar, and they said we got to find out what our vocabulary is. Does anybody have any idea of what they're talking about? Um, ask the question because there should be, um, in most domains, someone who's curating a vocabulary that is being accepted by by larger and larger groups, and you want to get in on that and bring people with you. So that when you define a particular type of data, that definition is the same. So that when you bring files together, data sets together, you're actually not having to wrangle it as much because the meaning of C, uh, CF convention. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is the same. 
and as opposed to, you know, I take, you know, sea level at, at three meters down and I take sea level at three meters up. Don't do that. Do it the same. Yeah, I just want to echo because I think Sarah is gently remind that our time is almost up or like already up. And but uh, one good example is the CF convention, which is a climate forecast convention that has been used across climate and weather community and also for satellites. So that's a good example of the standardized uh, rival name and the meaning of those rivals. Fantastic. Um, so I did lose track of time. Sorry about that. Um, are we, are Sarah, are we, did we get to the end? Yes, yeah, so I hate to end the conversation because this has been such a great webinar, but I'd like to encourage everyone to reach out to Shelly and Chris at Data Help. I'm sure Johan would be happy to hear from you all too. And we'll send out the recording in a few days or next week sometime. Thank you all very much for attending. Thank you. Thank thanks, you. Johan. Chris, thank you so much. <laughs> thank, thank you both. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks for everybody for coming. <laughs>